Okay, so um, so, so if we are streaming, I've just got a bit of personal stuff to deal with. Children, go to bed. Um, it's very late, and you must be very tired. Um, I'd like to thank David, of course, for stitching me up, for inviting me uh, to talk at this nice time. I stitched him up once, and now he's getting his revenge. Um, I've discovered something about myself the last couple of days, travelling uh, here with Darren and uh, footling around Knoxville and, and now being here, that um, we've been working together so long that we've become a bit like an old married couple. Um, we're pretty much finishing each other's sentences, uh, and now, as you discover, we're pretty much giving each other's talks. Um, it's pretty clear that other people knew this before I did. Uh, David would be one, I would imagine. Um, and what's more, he's worked out which one of us wears the trousers. Um, because when he was handing out titles, Darren got the rather grand, and you've already seen it, Prospects and Challenges for the Behavioural Ecology of Animal Social Networks. <laughs> By the time he got to handing out a title for me, <laughs> he was either running out of interest or patience or, or, or both. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to get through this as quickly as I can in, in the kind of minus two minutes I have left of my slot. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a simple talk because it's, it's got a simple message. But I'm a simple person and I've tried to go about things in a simple way. Uh, and the simple message really is that I think it's fantastic. Some of the things we do are really excited already uh, from what we've seen today about methods that we can potentially use uh, for static and dynamic uh, networks, but that data is king, that, you, that we really got to make sure we try and do no more nor less than our data allow us to do. Uh, and after that, we're, we're getting into trouble, in my view. So I got into this business thinking about uh, accumulated, aggregated association networks in which uh, some definition of group was made based on spatial proximity, and these things were uh, sampled extremely uh, sparsely, uh, and so we were forced, I thought, and I still think, uh, to be fairly low-key in the sorts of tests we could do to see whether or not there was some, there is some biological signal amongst all of the mess that's introduced by the way that we were collecting the data. So these are the two reprobates that got me into this um, <laughs> business, really. Um, both of them need a haircut. <laughs> Um, and, and kind of what they were interested in was uh, these, these beautiful little fish that Darren's already, already told you about that, that live in a truly uh, fluid social uh, system, do these kind of interesting things. And, and Darren's already said that what he's really interested in is can we get to the bottom of what are the mechanisms that promote what eventually leads to these things being prepared to risk their lives, apparently, to go and inspect a predator with someone they're not related to. That's a kind of cool thing to want to know. Uh, and so we constructed these kind of... Um, networks for uh, guppies and look for things like whether or not uh, these networks are sorted by uh, personality type. So independently assay their uh, some behavioral phenotype and see whether or not the network you get through this process of building the thing uh, shows some evidence that there is assortment by that uh, phenotype which might be part of the story towards understanding how they do this weird thing. Another example, uh, he's pretty hairy as well now I think of it. Um, <laughs> And he may have been once upon a time. <laughs> uh, these guys are interested in the Galapagos sea lion, uh, a fantastic thing. Uh, and just wanting to ask, look, pretty hard to see these things uh, underwater, but we can see where they haul out on the beach. Uh, can we tell anything from who they ha haul out on the beach with about what might be driving some of the social structure? And so again, build these kind of gambit of the group network, in this case, look for communities which are certainly driven by or consistent with uh, space use, although not quite with harems, which we expected. Um, but within these, there's almost certainly some sub-communities, just taking at face value that you can uh, accumulate these things uh, over the period that we did. Uh, and the sub-communities are hard to explain. So that's a kind of fun thing, because it makes you go back to your system and try and work out whether or not something is uh, driving that, that you hadn't thought of. So what kind of methods uh, did we use, and I, I, I'm far too tired to work out which kind of we this is, but if I can <laughs> deflect some blame, I will. <laughs> um, it's amazing what we've done, uh, or did do over many years, some of this goes back a long time, was simply to compute and test, to begin with node-based kind of measures of what the structure was, community membership as I've shown, network correlations, including uh, 
uh, correlations between attributes on the nodes at either end of edges, and then fiddling around, not comparing networks in any sensible way, but uh, trying hard to, at least when we had uh, some controlled sy uh, systems in the lab of the same individuals under two different contexts and seeing uh, how that could help. Why weren't we uh, doing what we should have been doing uh, in some ways, or thinking about using statistical models? Well, um, partly because I wasn't brave enough, and because it was my belief that I couldn't be sure that uh, our sampling protocol, and therefore our networks, uh, could possibly be obeying the assumptions underlying these things. Uh, the assumptions about conditional independence, um, the need for things to be uh, binary, at least to begin with, um, and that uh, these things would be just as redolent with false assumptions as anything we were building from scratch. So we would just build something from scratch and put up with the fact that we were going to be uh, not predictive, that we were going to be descriptive and, and fairly uh, conservative about these things. So what we got into uh, was thinking about constructing nulls uh, by a constrained randomization of the data, not of the network or anything else, but trying to go back to the sampling protocol and as best we could construct randomizations where we constrained everything we could that was um, telling us what happened in the sampling. Things like group sizes and how often you saw the animals, all those things that could otherwise have led to uh, apparent structure where there may have been uh, none. And so I guess you could kind of, um, this paper that Darren and I and a couple of others uh, put together a couple of years ago was sort of uh, expressing where we were with these static accumulated um, uh, networks. Uh, and in there we kind of broke things down into three different families of ways in which you could have your randomization, the basic version of which is not constrained and therefore not very useful, but uh, would then build on either to have a node label permutation, which I think Damien talked about the example of that, and all the kind of things in uh, quadratic assignment procedures and stuff, essentially permuting node labels. Um, not permuting the node labels, but permuting or scrambling the edges, uh, depending if that was your appropriate null, or if you were invoking the gambit of the groups to do group membership swaps and shuffles, but again constraining however you thought was appropriate and see what was there. And so even at that level, it, it's pretty easy to convince yourself that you have to pick the right null. You have to pick a null that doesn't just make statistical sense, but it makes biological sense, or sampling sense, or whatever it might be. Um, so the meeting in which I tried to stitch up David a couple of uh, summers ago uh, was in uh, Bielefeld, and we managed to convince this guy, he's been mentioned a few times, Tom Schneiders, uh, he worked partly in the Netherlands, partly in uh, England. And there's lots of places you can find out about this stuff, and this is one of my favorite papers in the annual review of sociology, I hope, I think. Um, and uh, it's a good read, and I recommend it to anyone who, who uh, kind of hasn't read it and would like to know about these things. One of the things I like that he does that doesn't always come out as clearly as it might do is the choice we're making when we try and make some sense of our networks about whether or not we're kind of controlling for the network structure, kind of treating it as a bit of a nuisance in, in his words. And so we might be doing that if we end up doing Mantel tests or quadratic assignment procedures. Generally, what we're doing there is conditionally uniform models. In other words, we're kind of constraining our randomization. We're putting in some things we think were there in the data and then letting, assuming the rest is random. Or we model the network structures. That's much more the sort of thing that people have been talking about uh, today. So the networks uh, are in there as outcome variables. There's no talk. Uh, in, in this or anywhere I've seen much about the possibility of network properties being uh, factors in some other property of the animal or the system that might be the outcome variable, but that would be interesting to know if people are. And so as far as I understand what Tom was telling us in this paper, basically it's a choice between having a design-based inference and a model-based uh, inference. So I think what I've been doing all this time is kind of this. Um, and Doing more of this would be great, provided, my one simple message, that the data are right, and uh, the way you've collected it and what you've collected satisfies the implicit or explicit assumptions of these models. So just to stay with Tom's paper for a bit, so among the single network models, still static uh, at this stage, there are various uh, latent space models, which I don't think we've heard so much about yet, although I think someone might be using block models. And uh, have something to say about them, uh, which would be interesting. And then we've heard much more about exponential random graph uh, models uh, and all, the, all its various uh, variants. 
So uh, here's where I appear to be uh, trying to have say the same thing as, as, as my partner, Darren. Um, except rather than what did we learn uh, about the biology of these things, I just wanted to share what through my kind of stumbling and ignorance I think we learned about uh, methodology, about how to try and extract something meaningful from these types of uh, networks. Uh, I think the first thing was that they are worth attention. There's plenty of species you can only look at this way. Uh, and there's plenty to learn about them that's good to know and they're not a poor relation just because you don't get you know two terabytes or whatever whatever you get uh, looking at other uh, systems that even descriptive approaches again even though they're, they're a poor cousin they can be done well and they can be done badly and they require care and thought and not just automatic use of whatever package someone makes available to you uh, that if you can uh, try and work with biologists that are good enough to replicate, then you should, um, and those that will manipulate as well, or indeed experiment, if you want to make those a separate thing, again, the sort of things that Darren was talking about this morning, then those things will help massively with seeing whether or not you really think you've got a signal or just a, a load of uh, junk. Uh, but most of all, you need to respect the constraints laid upon you by the data and the way they were collected. Uh, so people have talked a lot more and more lucidly than I will about matching the time scales of your question to your data and to your analysis. Uh, making sure you don't try and fool yourself about the extent to which you're measuring the interaction you really want or some proxy to it, which is really not a very close proxy. And the thing I've already mentioned and banged on about is that your uh, the statistical null that has to be in every model of any sort of these things has to be an appropriate biologi biological null if it possibly can be. So to me, the key question is how sure are you of your edges? So this is a question I learned the hard way to think about from uh, Hal at the back there, that uh, we uh, obsess with the uh, ones or the weighted non-zeros, and we really should obsess about whether the zeros uh, should also be ones, uh, or indeed the one zero. Uh, and until you're sure about that, and you're not equally unsure about all of these things, and I think you're not satisfying uh, the uh, underlying assumptions of many of the statistical models as they're currently uh, configured. So clearly, anyone who plays around with this stuff for some time hankers after thinking about process, at least on these things, or getting better, richer, denser data so that you can ask uh, dynamical questions. It's just an obvious uh, and sensible thing to want to do. And the first way I got into it was uh, uh, these characters, uh, both in Bristol, who have worked for a couple of hundred years on this little uh, species of rock ants. Um, and these are groovy little things that live in cracks and crevices uh, in Europe. Uh, and they came to me with a belting question, which got to me right to the heart of why social networks and animal social networks are most, much more interesting than many other types of networks, because potentially you have process and structure completely feeding back on each other and one informing the other. The change in that the process completely and utterly interacts with uh, structure. And so they came to me with what I thought was a belting question, which I completely failed to answer, um, was, look, you've got these highly related animals of a very high density. How on earth do they manage to be good at transmitting things like food, uh, and yet also so fantastic at blocking pathogens, which ought to come in and wipe them all out, and never seem to in, in, the, uh, in these things they kept in their labs. And so they were asking the good question, is there some underlying structure, and there is some spatial structure in this, species, they think. Is that, does that structure remain as it is, and then it's used slightly differently by the process, or is it the process, the stuff that's coming in, that determines the structure? Which way around is it? Is it either of those? And uh, what we planned as step one of a multi-step thing, um, for reasons you'll see in a minute, turned the first student blind, essentially, so we kind of uh, stopped, because this was all done uh, manually, and we didn't get very close to two terabytes of information. <laughs> all we had was four colonies brought into these artificial nests uh, pretending to be a rock crevice, uh, and these four colonies all behave fantastically differently. And what you do is you, what we did was starve them uh, for 48 hours, so that we're pretty sure that when we then gave them food, that's what they were going to concentrate on, was, was delivering food to the colony and compared it with a control in a way that I'll show you in a bit. So this is the person that started with me perfectly uh, able to see things, uh, and can't anymore. And this is an example of one of the networks which happens to be drawn as accumulated, but we analyzed it as a temporal. Uh, network. Oh. Well, we didn't call it that at the time. So this is not a proxy for anything in this case. Uh, this is uh, this ant has produced a glob 
of sugar solution because that's all we fed them and it's being received by this one and if you look hard enough in the videos you can tell by the what they're doing with antennae which one is uh, giving and which ones are receiving so we're pretty confident that we got by tracking these half an hour uh, of each of these colonies um, enough information to be able to say something about what they were doing in these things and I'll come back to that so um, there's only so many students you can turn blind before you think you need, like everybody else, to look for a better way of getting data by the means that people have talked about a lot. Reality mining seems to have caught on, perhaps because biologging is such a horrible thing to say. Uh, there's lots of ways you can do it, and the attractions are uh, obvious. And so the ways I've got into this, uh, one of the first ones was this uh, woman, Sarah in Sumner, now in Bristol, had PhD students. Uh, based in Lausanne, and she works on these fantastic paper wasps uh, in Panama, you know, some old disused US Air Force base, uh, where she's allowed to go roam around and look at these wasps on the kind of overhang from the doorways, mostly, I think. And what Sarin uh, discovered uh, quite a long time ago is that there's quite a lot of drifting of workers between nests. And so she got this student to see if she could look at networks of these drifting events. And so what she did was uh, put uh, RFID tags on each of the uh, wasps and then cover up the nest apart from a couple of antennas to see when they were going through and record what was going on and you get these drifting networks which then you manip they manipulated uh, the brood worker ratio to try and manipulate the need for effort on different uh, nests and see how the thing responded. So that's the kind of question they were into. Uh, another example is from these awesome things, the New Caledonian crows. These are the famous uh, tool-using crows that make and manipulate uh, tools to dig out these uh, grubs. And there's a couple of uh, groups that work on this in species in the field in New Caledonia. And one of the key questions is to find out whether or not what's going on here you only learn uh, vertically from your parents or whether there are other social opportunities to learn how to use tools and new tools and adjust them. And so Christian Rutz, who's now in uh, St. Andrews, thank you very much, and James St. Clair, who is on the run from the police, you can tell by <laughs> uh, the way he looks there. Um, they've been putting on this encounter net stuff for these little uh, antennae that are not very much weight, and you put them on the back of these things. And so they're proximity loggers, but ones where, in principle, you can get a signal up to 30 meters, but then it will be stronger when they're closer and you've got a chance to tell where these things are for something that's just impossible to go and observe uh, in the canopy, in the forest. Uh, uh, Darren's already talked about this, so this is his, uh, these are these collars on the cows, this is female, male. Um, <laughs> and the kind of thing, <laughs> and the kind of things that Darren's interested in um, are kind of closer to a knockout that basically the farmer <coughs> takes out something like 25% of the herd each year and the question is how does the herd respond uh, to that happening? Quite a nice question to ask and so he's doing that with different types of proximity. So the typical kind of questions uh, we're asking ourselves now is are the obvious ones that people have again said much better than I have. How does structure affect process? Does process affect structure? Are there key players or events in the process? And how does the system respond to perturbation? So what are the methods that I've used so far? Nothing nearly so exciting and sophisticated as we had in the last talk. Doing very, very simple causal <laughs> contact tracing. So just uh, starting somewhere and just seeing how information or food or whatever it is might be or is passed through, either by uh, observation or emulation of a process on the time-ordered contact structure we have, uh, using pretty simple measures of influence to try and determine whether there are key events or players uh, either looking back in time or forward in time. Um, still sticking with randomizations of the data, so constrained and this time certainly time-respecting constraints, so you can pass through to any other animal that was there or whatever the rule might be. Uh, and uh, slightly more use of simple uh, biological models of process, a physical model, biological model, social model, whatever you want to, just positing that something's going on and uh, seeing how that tallies up with what you actually see. So very quickly, uh, this is, an, this is uh, an example from the, the little rock ants, 
that these four colonies replication is everything because they all did very, very different things uh, apart from a couple. And one of the things they all did the same was uh, after starvation, the way in which some each animal got food or had a, each animal in the whole colony got food had some kind of similarity to it. E you know, fit pretty well by a very simple model of homogeneous mixing in this case, which is a bit of a surprise given what was known about the species. And then time-constrained randomizations of the feeding events actually suggested uh, that the food provision in these colonies was partitioned, that not all ants were feeding their influence, didn't go through the whole colony. It was as if it was kind of partially partitioned out, so you weren't reaching all of the animals with all of the food, and that may or may not be the case, but it's, uh, it's been quite interesting. So what else is out there? Well, not much, as Tanya said, but there's some. Um, I think she's got a chapter in this book, and so does uh, Ben Blonde, who I'll come to in a minute. So Petterholm and uh, Aris Aramecki, um, kind of from the physics, applied math, computer science end of the spectrum, which is where most of this stuff comes from, and thinking about temporal networks. Slightly older book also by Springer, by Tito Gross, you know, there's a adaptive network. So the physicists kind of take on uh, networks where there's rewiring on the same kind of time scale as there is process occurring, whatever that process might be. And I think those are all those are interesting uh, reading and there's lots to do. My kind of little contribution to this was with this force of nature, uh, Ben Blonder, so it's the paper that Tanya mentioned in her talk. Um, he collared me and Andy C at a conference um, when I was trying to talk about the ants and, um, well, just forced us to do things, really. <laughs> um, and I read it again uh, in preparation for this and I think he did a good job. He talked about some sensible things in a pretty sensible way, talking about key time scales and uh, his way of thinking about the different flow dynamics and topological dynamics, whether it's the edges or the process or, or both the feedbacks between them. Uh, so he was talking a lot about this uh, issue of having time windowing and uh, how you would aggregate them, and, and but not thinking much more about saying these things. So Tanya has told us much more about them, but I still think it's a, a good read. And it definitely is the case that there's a lot, even though there's not as much as you would like there to be, there's so much you can explore and play with. Um, but it's really important just to keep reminding ourselves that it will be a rare and beautiful thing if we do have perfect data. So just to go back to some of the cases I've just looked at, if you happen to uh, catch your wasp and put an RFID tag on it when it just drifted, then it will look like it's doing a lot of drifting when it just goes back to its natal nest. Uh, equally, if it just decides that the nicest place to sit for half an hour is on the rim of the antenna, it will look like it's a very busy wasp when it really isn't. And you just have to care about these things. Uh, Darren always already mentioned that uh, these things, these, these collars that, you put on, that we put on the cows, um, have very different uh, distances in which they see each other, and that will have a huge effect on how social you think the animal is if you don't try and do something about it, and it's not obvious what you should do. And even these encounter tags, you really have to think about how you calibrate for the fact that these crows can be up in different uh, habitats or have different propagation properties of the radio waves between them, um, that the tag, even if it's perfect, will have this uh, donut shape to where the power goes, so the power won't go the same in all directions, and so a strong signal uh, going weaker might just mean that one of them is rotating. You've really got to be so careful uh, that you don't get too excited about the differentiation between uh, animals, because sometimes it will be a differentiation between the technology. So what did we learn so far from playing around as uh, complete amateurs with these sorts of things? Well, the trite point is we learned that all of the things that were important before are still important. You know, that you've still got to, these things definitely deserve attention, you've still got to though, respect your data constraints and ask how sure you are of your edges and whether or not they're really up to doing what you subsequently ask them to do in your analysis. Uh, and also, uh, it made us consider that biological or social models could, I think, be a really important component of this, not necessarily jumping all the way to a statistical model, but actually building something from biological principles, or social principles, that says that a big part of this is due to things that we think we understand, or at least to hypothesize. Definitely learn to consider uh, causality of events. And then something that doesn't get mentioned quite as much as it might, I think, is this point about whether or not you really think your edges or your uh, experiment was an instantiation of 
something that could happen in this system, or is somehow represented. And whether or not you've got any reason to believe you went back a week later and did the same thing with the same animals as far as you understood under the same conditions, whether you would get the same data. And if you're not sure about that, then ideally look at it, or if not, don't build an analysis which assumes that you've absolutely nailed what these things do, because you may be disappointed. So that's my summary. Oh, uh, these things are both interesting. I'm really excited uh, to see what people have to say about methods to look at both static and uh, temporal or dynamic networks, and I'm definitely here to learn rather than to preach. Um, but I do believe uh, that methods, as well as questions, should still be driven by the data, and the data shouldn't be assumed to be perfect just because they're voluminous. Um, they're not quite the same thing, and we should still think hard about uh, whether or not they are a good proxy for the thing we're really interested in uh, about our animals or not. Um, and I think I'll stop. Thank you.